Welcome to Blurge. I'm Diane Planetan, and you're in the right place if you're ready to create inspired life. And we do so by working on our own personal development. So we can be strong role models for those we love and mentor and be strong for ourselves and our own mindset. Today is chapter 21 in my Psych 100 journey at Queen's University, and it's all about hearing. So let's get started. Hearing allows us to perceive the world of acoustic vibrations all around us and provides us with our most important channels of communication. This module reviews the basic mechanisms of hearing, beginning with the anatomy and physiology of the ear and a brief review of the auditory pathways up to the auditory cortex. An outline of the basic perceptual attributes of sound, including loudness, pitch, and timbre, is followed by a review of the principles of tonotopic organization established in the cochlea. An overview of masking and frequency selectivity is followed by a review of the perception and neural mechanisms underlying spatial hearing. Finally, an overview is provided of auditory scene analysis, which tackles the important question of how the auditory system is able to make sense of the complex mixtures of sound that are encountered in everyday acoustic environments. The learning objectives for this chapter is to be able to describe the basic auditory attributes of sound, describe the structure and general function of the auditory pathways from the outer ear to the auditory cortex, Discuss ways in which we are able to locate sounds in space. Describe various acoustic cues that contribute to our ability to perceptually segregate simultaneously arriving sounds. As usual, I am not a teacher. I am a student sharing my journey with you wherever you are in the world. Perceptual attributes of sound. There are many ways to describe a sound, but the perceptual attributes of sound can typically be divided into three main categories, namely loudness, pitch, and timbre. Although all three refer to perception and not to the physical sounds themselves, they are strongly related to various physical variables. Loudness. The most direct physical correlate of loudness is sound intensity or sound pressure measured close to the eardrum. However, many other factors also influ influence the loudness of a sound, including its frequency content, its duration, and the context in which it is presented. Some of the earliest psychophysical studies of auditory perception going back more than a century were aimed at examining the relationship between perceived loudness the physical sound intensity, and the just noticeable differences in loudness. A great deal of time and effort has been spent refining various measurement methods. These methods involve techniques such as magnitude estimation, where a series of sounds are presented sequentially at different sound levels, and subjects are asked to assign numbers to each tone, corresponding to the perceived loudness. Other studies have examined how loudness changes a function of the frequency of a tone, resulting in the international standard ISO loudness level contours, which are used in many areas of industry to assess noise and annoyance issues. Such studies have led to the development of computational models that are designed to predict the loudness of arbitrary sounds. Pitch. Pitch plays a crucial role in acoustic communication. Pitch variations over time provide the basis of melody for most type of music. Pitch contours in speech provide us with important prosodic information in non-tone languages such as English and help define the meaning of words in tone languages such as Mandarin Chinese. Pitch is essentially the perceptual correlate of waveform periodicity or repetition rate. The faster a waveform repeats over time, the higher it is perceived pitch. The most common pitch evoking sounds are known as harmonic complex tones. They are complex because they consist of more than one frequency and they are harmonic because the frequencies are all integer multiples of common fundamental frequency. For instance, a harmonic complex tone with an FO of 100 hertz would also contain energy at frequencies 
of 200, 300, and 400 hertz, and so on. These higher frequencies are known as harmonics or overtones, and they also play an important role in determining the pitch of a sound. In fact, even if the energy at the FO is absent or masked, we generally still perceive the remaining sound to have a pitch corresponding to the FO. This phenomenon is known as the pitch of the missing fundamental, and it has played an important role in the formulation of theories and modules about pitch. We hear pitch with sufficient accuracy to perceive melodies over a range of FO from about 330 hertz up to about 4 to 5 kilohertz. This range also corresponds quite well to the range covered by musical instruments. For instance, the modern grand piano has notes that extend from 27.5 hertz to 4,186 hertz. We are able to discriminate changes in frequency above 5,000 hertz, but we are no longer very accurate in recognizing melodies or judging musical intervals. Timbre. Timbre refers to the quality of sound and is often described using words such as bright, dull, harsh, and hollow. Technically, timbre includes anything that allows us to distinguish two sounds that have the same loudness, pitch, and duration. For instance, a violin and a piano playing the same note sound very different based on their sound quality or timbre. An important aspect of timbre is the spectral content of a sound. Sounds with more high frequency energy tend to sound brighter, tinnier, or harsher than sounds with more low frequency content, which might be described as deep, rich, or dull. Other important aspects of timbre include the temporal envelope of the sound, especially how it begins and ends. For instance, a piano has a rapid onset or attack produced by the hammer striking the string, whereas the attack of a clarinet note can be much more gradual. Artificially changing the onset of a piano note by, for instance, playing a recording backwards can dramatically alter its character so that it is no longer recognizable as a piano note. In general, the overall spectral content and the temporal envelope can provide a good first approximation to any sound, but it turns out that subtle changes in the spectrum over time are crucial in creating plausible imitations of natural musical instruments. Next is an overview of the auditory system. So I hope you're looking at this on YouTube because there's a really good visual here. And it's a diagram of the human ear. And it says specifically, notice the cochlea labeled here. It is in the location of the auditory hair cells that are tonotopically organized. Where is the cochlea? Oh, there it is. Okay, take, an, take a look, see, it's really quite nice. Our auditory perception depends on how sound is processed through the ear. The ear can be divided into three main parts, the outer, middle, and inner ear. The outer ear consists of the pina and the tympanic membrane. Of course, most of us have two functioning ears, which turns out to be particularly useful when we are trying to figure out where sound is coming from. As discussed below in the section on spatial hearing, our brain can compare the subtle differences in the signals at the two ears to localized sounds in space. However, this trick does not always help. For instance, a sound in front of or directly behind you will not produce a difference between the ears. In these cases, the filtering produced by the pinae helps us localize sounds and resolve potential front, back, and up-down confusions. More generally, the folds and bumps of the pinae produce distinct peaks and dips in the frequency response that depend on the location of the sound source. The brain then learns to associate certain patterns of spectral peaks and dips with certain spatial locations. Interestingly, this learned association remains malleable or plastic even in adulthood. For instance, a study that altered the pinae using mold found in people could learn to use their new ears accurately within a matter of weeks. 
Because of the small size of the PNA, these kinds of acoustic cues are only found at high frequency above 2 kilohertz. At lower frequencies, the sound is basically unchanged, whether it comes from above, in front, or below. The ear canal itself is a tube that helps to amplify sounds in the region from about 1 to 4 kilohertz, a region particularly important for speech communication. The middle ear consists of an air-filled cavity which contains the middle ear bones known as the incus, malus, and stapes, or anvil, hammer, and stirrup because of their respective shapes. They have the distinction of being the smallest bones in the body. Their primary function is to transmit the vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the oval window of the cochlea and via a form of lever action to better match the impedance of the air surrounding the tympanic membrane with that of the fluid uh, within the cochlea. The inner ear includes the cochlea encased in the temporal bone of the skull in which the mechanical vibrations of the sound are transduced into neural signals that are produced, processed by the brain. The cochlea is a spiral shaped structure that is filled with fluid. Along the length of the spiral runs the basilar membrane, which vibrates in response to the pressure differences produced by vibrations of the oval window. Sitting on the basilar membrane is the organ of the cordy, which runs the entire length of the basilar membrane from the base. The organ of the cordy includes three rows of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells. The hair cells sense the vibrations by the way their tiny hair or stereocilia. The outer hair cells seem to function to mechanically amplify the sound induced vibrations, whereas the inner hair cells form synapses with the auditory nerve and transduce those vibrations into action potentials or neural spikes which are transmitted along the auditory nerve to higher centers of the auditory pathways. One of the most important principles of hearing, frequency analysis, is established in the cochlea. In a way, the action of the cochlea can be likened to that of a prism. The many frequencies that make up complex sound are broken down into their constituent frequencies with low frequencies creating maximum basilar membrane vibrations near the apex of the cochlea and high frequencies creating maximal basilar membrane vibrations near the base of the cochlea. This decomposition of sound into its constitutes frequencies and the frequency to place mapping or tonotopic representation is a major organizational principle of the auditory system and is made in the neural representation of sounds all the way from the cochlea to the primary auditory cortex. The decomposition of sound into its constitute frequency components is part of what allows us to hear more than one sound at a time. In addition to representing frequency by place of excitation within the cochlea, frequencies are also represented by the timing of spikes within the auditory nerve. This property, known as phase locking, is crucial in comparing time of arrival differences to waveforms between the two ears. Unlike vision, where the primary visual cortex is considered an, an early stage of processing, auditory signals go through many stages of processing before they reach the primary auditory cortex located in the temporal lobe. Although we have a fairly good understanding of the electromechanical properties of the cochlea and its various structures, our understanding of the processing accomplished by higher stages of the auditory pathways remains somewhat sketchy. With the possible exception of spatial localization and neurons tuned in tuned to certain locations in space, there is very little consensus on how, what, and where of auditory features extraction and representation. There is evidence for pitch center in the auditory cortex from both human neuroimaging studies and single unit physiology studies. But even here, there remain some questions regarding whether a single area of cortex is responsible for coding single features such as pitch or whether the code is more distributed. 
audibility, masking, and frequency selectivity. Overall, the human cochlea provides us with hearing over a very wide range of frequencies. Young people with normal hearing are able to perceive sounds with frequencies ranging from about 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. The range of intensities we can perceive is also impressive. The quietest sound we can hear in the medium frequency range have a sound intensity that is about a factor of, well, that looks like 1 billion, <laughs> less intense than the loudest sound we can listen to without incurring rapid and permanent hearing loss. In part because of this enormous dynamic range, we tend to use a logarithmic scale known as decibels to describe sound pressure or intensity. The first is based on interaural time differences and relies on the fact that a sound source on the left will generate sound that will reach the left ear slightly before it reaches the right ear. Although sound is much slower than light, its speed still means that the time of arrival differences between the two ears is a fraction of a millisecond. The largest ITD we encounter in the real world are only a little over half a millisecond. With some practice, humans can learn to detect an ITD between 10 and 20 microseconds. The second source of information is based on interval level differences. At higher frequencies, the head casts an acoustic shadow so that when a sound is presented from the left, the sound level at the left ear is somewhat higher than the sound level at the right ear. At very high frequencies, the ILD can be as much as 20 decibels, and we are sensitive to differences as small as one decibel. As mentioned briefly in the discussion of the outer ear, information regarding the elevation of sound source or whether it comes from in front or behind is contained in high frequency spectral details that result from the filtering effects of the PNA. In general, we are most sensitive to ITDs at low frequencies. At higher frequencies, we can still perceive changes in timing based on the slow varying temporal envelope of the sound, but not the temporal fine structure. Perhaps because of a loss of neural phase locking to the temporal fine structure at high frequencies. In contrast, ILDs are most useful at high frequencies where the head shadow is the greatest. This use of different acoustic cues in different frequency ranges regions led to the classic and very early duplex theory of sound localization. For everyday sounds with a broad frequency spectrum, it seemed that our perception of spatial location is dominated by interaural time differences in the low frequency temporal fine structure. As with vision, our perception of distance depends to a large degree on context. If we hear someone shouting at a very low sound level, we infer that the shouter must be far away, based on our knowledge of the sound properties of shouting. In rooms and other enclosed locations, the reverberation can also provide information about distance. As a speaker moves further away, the direct sound level decreases but the sound level of the reverberation remains about the same. Therefore, the ratio of direct to reverberant energy decreases. Auditory scene analysis. There is usually more than one sound source in the environment at any one time. Imagine talking with a friend at a cafe with some background music playing, the rattling of coffee mugs behind the counter, traffic outside, and a conversation going on next to yours, or your dog snoring in the background while you're trying to record this topic. <laughs> All these sources produce sound waves that combine to form a single complex waveform at the eardrum, the shape of which may bear very little relationship to any of the waves produced by the individual sound sources. Somehow the auditory system is able to break down or decompose these complex waveforms and allow us to make sense of our acoustic environment by forming separate 
auditory objects or streams, which we can follow as the sounds unfold over time. A number of heuristic principles have been formulated to describe how sound elements are grouped to form a single object or segregated to form multiple objects. Many of these originate from the early ideas proposed in vision by the so-called Gestalt psychologists, such as Max Wertheimer. According to these rules of thumb, sounds that are in close proximity in time or frequency tend to be grouped together. Also, sounds that begin and end at the same time tend to form a single auditory object. Interestingly, spatial location is not always a strong or reliable grouping cue, perhaps because the location information from individual frequency components is often ambiguous due to the effects of reverberation. Several studies have looked into the relative importance of different cues by trading off one cue against the other. In some cases, this has led to the discovery of interesting auditory illusions where melodies that are not present in the sounds presented to either ear emerge in the perception or where a sound element is perpetually lost in competing perceptual organizations. More recent attempts have been used computational and neural based approaches to uncover the mechanisms of auditory scene analysis and the field of computational auditory scene analysis has emerged in part as an effort to move towards more principal and less heuristic approaches to understanding the parsing and perception of complex auditory scenes. Solving this problem will not only provide us with a better understanding of human auditory perception, but may provide new approaches to smart hearing aids and cochlear implants, as well as automatic speech recognition systems that are more robust to background noise. In conclusion, hearing provides us with our more most important connection to the people around us. The intricate physiology of the auditory system transforms the tiny variations in air pressure that reach our ear into the vast array of auditory experiences that we perceive as speech, music, and sound from the environment around us. We are only beginning to understand the basic principles of neural coding in higher stages of the auditory system and how they relate to perception. However, even our rudimentary understanding has improved the lives of hundreds of thousands through devices such as cochlear implants, which recreate some of the ear's functions for people with profound hearing loss. Well, I really enjoyed that. I didn't know a lot of that information, and I'm going to study that diagram a little bit more. Well, if you like the show, share it with somebody you know, and hey, maybe some leave some comments. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know about your journey, and let me know how you stay inspired to keep going, how you power down and focus and study and get the job done, because we all are here to help one another out so we can all live a more inspired life.